I keep moving around. Hi, this is author A.R. Shaw with Apocalypse Queen Radio. And today I have author Nicholas Sansbury Smith. And I'm going to call you Nick for short, if that's OK. Absolutely. And I have to say that this is a, a copyrighted podcast with Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. And today we are here talking about hell divers. Nick's got a lot of news to share with us. He's got his T-shirt on. And uh, let's see, I've known Nick for, gosh, how long? I don't know, a couple of years. A couple of years, yeah. Yeah, that's funny. Um, OK, what do you want to I know that you have big news you want to talk about. So what's um, um, what's but let's first talk about how you became an author. I'm sorry. OK, um, so I've been an author for well, full time author for five years. I mean, I've I've been writing pretty much since I was old enough, but uh, I didn't really get serious about it until I was in probably after college. And uh, I think it was in 2013, I wrote a book called Orbs and that kind of mm -hmm. launched my career. I've actually just relaunched that series because I got the rights back from uh, Simon & Schuster. So I got my start in self-publishing. Um, I have my foot kind of in the traditional world of publishing with um, books published by Blackstone. The Helldiver series is all with Blackstone Publishing. Um, mm -hmm. Orbs was with Simon & Schuster. Now it's um, self-published. And then the German edition is coming out through, I believe it's Penguin? I can't even remember, honestly. Uh, and then my Extinction Cycle was self-published, but then Orbit with Hachette is, has picked it up, and they've put all the all seven books out in mass market. So, And then my Tracker series is self-published, and um, what am I forgetting? Am I forgetting something? No, that's those are my four series, yeah. So um, I just finished my 21st book the other day. That will be with Blackstone. I think the news you're talking about is that um, – my next seven books will be with Blackstone Publishing. So they'll be in hardcover, paperback, ebook, and then audio, of course. Um, That's very Blackstone cool. Does it. Yeah, so I'm pretty excited. They do a fantastic job with my books, and I really enjoy working with those guys. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of, I am still will be doing some self-publishing on the side, but mm -hmm. most of my work will be exclusive with Blackstone. I'm just checking with uh, a couple of the fans. Cheryl Elliott says she can't hear. Can you hear now? Um, Marco Santoya says it sounds great. Russ Olson, he says this is great. Uh, Victor, and some of these are your fans, I think, right? Or yeah, most of them are your fans. You recognize yeah. the names. Yeah. You're welcome to chime in and say hi or talk okay. to them. Well, oh, there they are. Okay, I couldn't see, see? any. Okay. Now. Yeah, so now I'm seeing the questions. Okay. Um, From yeah, Texas. Cool. Well, welcome, everybody. Yay. Um, Colonel Olson, <laughs> good to see you. Colonel Olson. I have a colonel yeah. friend. Yeah, we all have a friend, a friend that's a colonel. That's the weirdest thing. Yeah. Every one of us do. Yeah, I'm having dinner with my colonel tomorrow night. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> okay, so looks like there aren't really any questions yet. but um, No questions yet, but they, they'll come. Ask questions if you've got them. I just finished Hell Divers. And uh, I, I realized early on that you have some background in this. And you did work for, I checked your your. I checked your background. And so you um, you worked for Homeland Security. Can you tell us how that might have affected your your work? Sure. So that, that job was back in 2000. I'm trying to think of, I worked there for like five years or so. I worked for the state of Iowa for 10 years before I started writing. Wow. And a good portion of that I spent at Iowa Homeland Security and Emergency Management, working hand in hand with FEMA on disaster uh, mitigation here in Iowa and surrounding mm -hmm. states. Most of the work that I specialized in was dis disaster mitigation planning and um, also safe rooms and the hardening of power lines, wow. so infrastructure projects. Uh, we have a lot of ice storms in Iowa that take down power lines, uh, tornadoes, floods. So mm -hmm. a lot of the, the federal dollars we were working with were federal FEMA dollars that came in after 2008 when we had ma massive flooding in eastern Iowa and Cedar Rapids in Iowa City wow. where I went to school, uh, undergrad. So um, that, you know, that experience taught me a lot about preparation and um, kind of gave me a background in disaster mitigation uh, work. And that's spilled over into my and inspired me to write, especially the tracker series is probably where you would see most of the um, kind of the the prepping type tips. Um, but it also 
I, I like to use how the government functions during disaster with FEMA and the um, you know cities with their local jurisdictions working hand in hand with the feds and all all of that how it how it unfolds when a disaster happens because I got to see that firsthand on the uh, ground level. So great background. I think that's, yeah, it really did help um, understanding how what kind of uh, response the the both the state and federal and even the local government has when there's a major disaster. Um, and you really so, got to see people's reactions. And sorry, there's an echo, but you but, you got to see people's reactions in uh, disasters. You know how right. Hand. yeah right people that have lost their homes in floods or tornadoes. Yeah that have been displaced that are trying to get, um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of grants available for people in situations like that. So I did do a lot of grant work as well, helping communities recover, um, working hand in hand with schools, um, to, to help them build safe rooms. And, and those are tornado oh, okay. safe rooms here in the mm-hmm. U S in the, in Iowa, those aren't like, they're not bomb shelters. I always get that question. They wouldn't protect from a bomb, but they definitely do protect from up to, Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it was 300 and it's 361 miles per hour wind. Wow. FEMA 360. Yeah. It sounds like it's been a long time since I pulled out that handbook, but uh, yeah. So that was, that background really did help me with my writing. Um, Gave me some story ideas too, uh, because the state hazard mitigation plan here in Iowa has, all sorts of threats that most Iowans wouldn't even think about, like earthquakes, for example, or, mm-hmm. um, you know, Yellowstone, the super volcano there. I mean, the those Caldera. are all on. Yeah. Yeah. Those are on the radar of pretty much every state. And I never would have thought that before I, I started working there. So, yeah. 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 Um, let's see. You do have a, a question here, and I think we already kind of covered it. So Mikey Four says, how does a young aspiring writer get into self-publishing? Um um some of us get inspired by the oddest of things and yeah uh yeah but i I wonder if that question is how they actually go about self-publishing the i mean what i did was i I had an author friend that kind of helped me too but amazon provides all sorts of Mm -hmm. um, avenues by step process yeah so i would i would start there i would check the kindle direct publishing page and see exactly what steps and then if you're serious about self-publishing, looking into, I have a 10 step um, guideline for aspiring authors that I posted on my blog oh, like cool. a year ago. And mm-hmm. it kind of goes through like what I think people should do based on what I've experienced. And I also kind of do some marketing cons- um, consulting on the side for it's, it's ebook marketing. Um, mm-hmm. So I put together a lot of stuff and really what you need to do is you need to start with writing your book finding and then once once you feel like you've written the best book possible you know finding a cover artist getting it formatted then getting it published mm-hmm. or self-publishing it and making editing, sure that you edit it yeah of course editing editing, editing editing yeah, yeah, I'd have to, yeah. yeah i wonder if i have that link available i'll post that say, later yeah because you know what if you can tell me what it is i'll write it and it'll show up on the screen okay what's your website do it's, you have that option on yours yeah, let, okay, let well, me just do tag it, it real yeah. quick. Yeah, Go ahead. yeah. Um, I have that under my uh, articles, I think. Yeah, so I'm on my website, and cool. let's see, ten. Yeah, top ten tips for aspiring authors. This should pretty much answer that question. Awesome, that's great. I'll post that in the chat here. Yay! If I can get it to load. Hmm. Okay. I'm trying um, to. Okay, here we go. There we go. Got it. Okay. Or is okay, that the great. team chat? Is the team chat the same thing with? Oh, as no, the- that's a private chat. That's where I can say your dog's barking or that kind okay. of Sorry. Well, unfortunately, it's not letting me okay. post in the live comments. So maybe you can post that yeah. from the team chat. I can do that. What is it? <laughs> um, oh, I posted oh, wait, the link in the Just a second. I'm sorry. Okay. You're way ahead of me. I got it. Cool. Let's see. I don't, you know what? It's just going to, I think it's just going to show on the screen. Yeah, there it is. Is it? Yay. Yep. I don't see it. I, I see it right. It. Oh, there it is. Can you guys copy that down real quick? I don't know. We'll leave it up for a little bit. We don't mind. Um, there were some other questions or let's see. Uh, Tess or Teresa Ellett Russ. She says she loves your books and she's read all of them. 
Wow. But she's awesome. She's yeah, that's awesome. awesome. Um, let's see. You you know a lot of these people, so go ahead and say hi and chime in. Yeah. Okay. Um, looks like Mikey did get that comment there. So here's Jorge. Hi, Jorge. And then Jack is asking about his favorite dog, Creek, who is a character in my extinction, or I'm sorry, in my tracker series. I've lost track of all the dogs I've had. And Creek is doing well. Yeah. He's on a mission right now. I was writing about Creek earlier today. Uh -huh. um, and then let's see what else. Teresa, that was very kind of you. Uh, Colin Davis on book four of the extinction cycle. Some fan art. To, oh, there's some fan art of the variants on my website too. If you click on, um, let's see, I'm trying to think. It's for, it's called Four Fans. And then you go under there, there's a bunch of artwork people have sent me through for all my series. Is it nicholassansberrysmith.com? Is that yep. your? Yep, correct. Um, Martha's asking about my Mafia series. So that's my next post apocalyptic thriller um, that. It should be coming after the Helldiver series. I haven't named, I have named it, but I haven't un, uh, really explained anything about the plot or at least what the name is yet. Um, hopefully we'll do that soon. I, I don't even know when it's going to be published yet. Um, Hi, Walt. Uh, okay, I think that's, I think that's all of the, the fan questions that we got so far. Terrence, you're, you're all the way from Australia? Oh That's yeah, pretty cool. Terrence is a cool guy. He's a screenwriter and and he is looking into self publishing some novels he's written as well. Wow, I just uh, spent the last or a couple of days at uh, the oh, connecting connecting um, writers with Hollywood convention here in Spokane. Oh cool, cool. and um, yeah, so that was kind of cool. So there were a lot of screenwriters there as well. So that was awesome. that was fun. And Walt Browning. Yeah. How you doing, Walt? I need to get in touch with you soon. I'm still waiting to hear back on the uh, Kendall World stuff, so I will let you know as soon as I do. Um, Stephen Laporte likes the Extinction Cycles. Which book or series would you suggest? I guess is my question. If I guess I would probably say Hell Divers next. If you're asking about which series, um, all right. Cool. When Space Opera be published? Ask Cheryl Stout. Um, that one's probably not, that's been pushed back to 2019 just because, um, Blackstone wanted some more Helldivers books. So book four of Helldivers will be out in November of this year and book five should be out early next year. And then we have to do the mafia book. So I'll start writing the space opera books in early 2019. They're all plotted and the outline's good, good to go. So I just need to find time between my other projects to write those. Um, Michael's asking about the Helldivers movie TV mm -hmm. news yet. That contract is still, I'm not exactly sure what's going on with it. It's, I think it's in a, uh, in CAA, which is a, um, film agency, um, in the legal department. Can you talk about there. that? So yeah. Sometimes I can't, you can't right now. No. No. Yeah. <laughs> so don't say so, a word. <laughs> yeah. It's been going on for a long time. So that's all I really said is just that the mm -hmm. contract's out there and we're waiting for it to finish and, yeah, so. that's it. yeah, these things can, can um, go really slowly and it can be very frustrating from what I've, I've learned with Hollywood anyway. Yeah, it's definitely, um, I would say when it comes to the movie route, if a book gets optioned, it's about a 1% chance that it actually hits. Literally 1% chance. It's not very good. Yeah. I mean, it's, it depends on who you, you sign with. So right. if you have someone that has the capability of making the movie, the mm -hmm. odds go up. Uh, right. the, the, that's why I decided to go with the people that I'm going with. There had been a couple of their option or offers on the Helldiver series that I said no to just because one, it wasn't that much money and to tie up the rights. And two, you don't really, unless someone is really, really serious, they're, mm -hmm. unless someone puts some money down, they're probably not very serious about it. Right. So, right. um, Ryan Seeger, yeah, there's hopefully there will be a movie. That's what we're talking about right now. But I know Ryan actually worked with me at HSEMD. That's how I know Ryan. Oh, cool. So he's a good friend, yeah. Um, um, I get behind on the questions whenever we start talking, so. Yeah. Um, oh, Cheryl says she's waiting to, ha what, to see what happens to X. Don't yeah. spoil anything. I just finished book one. So. Yeah. 
The, I won't say anything because <laughs> I do have a lot of readers that are, you know, still on book two or haven't started book three. And um, there's, I'm, I'm on book five right now. So book four won't even be out till November. So I try not to talk too much about the plot, yeah. but X is definitely a favorite character. Um, Cause yeah. I, I had a different perspective after book one. So Terrence, Terrence is asking, how long do you usually spend outlining? Um, that's a good question. Uh, usually I spend a couple days putting together the plots and then it becomes a month long project of actually getting it to the point where I can sit down and start writing. Uh, I used to not, I, when I first started, I didn't outline like that, but now it's, that's really helped, um, increase my pro productivity. So now when I outline, I pretty much have everything ready to go. Like for example, the tracker spinoff, I have all 20, actually it's 21 chapters as of today outlined. Same thing with my Helldivers 5 and my Mafia book. They're all outlined by chapter and then I break them down by a character point of view. So I know exactly which character is gonna be for which scene in each chapter. Mm -hmm. um, I write in third person past tense. So each each chapter is gonna have about two point of views broken up by time stamp. That. Yeah. yeah, I noticed I like, that. I like to do it that way because then I can focus on more characters instead of just one. And mm -hmm. um, I've written some first person, but I just don't like that style because it doesn't allow it's me to- It's very limiting. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So uh, like I said, I mean, it takes, my outline process kind of depends on the book, but it's definitely as I've focused more on this career and, and my output, my writing output, and I see some people say write faster, well, I'm pretty much at my limit right now. I know. Uh, so, I feel you. <laughs> yeah. I get those emails too. And it's like going as fast as I can. Life gets in the way too. I mean, I'm um, already at four books this year. So it's yeah, been, we're not even going to talk about what I'm, where I am. I think I'm okay. on three actually. I am. Well, I'm good. actually yeah, on that's three. Really good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. I'm, I really like to uh, keep my uh, word count up though, in terms of how long my books are. Mm -hmm. I still aim to, to go hit around ninety to hundred thousand words, which is the you That's know full length novel. That's full length. Yeah, the, the, all right, and the trend right now. I was talking to another author about this earlier today. The trend really is to to write shorter novels mm -hmm. and put them out as fast as possible. And I don't like to do that because, well, for one, I mean, those you want a novels, whole story. Yeah. yeah, and they don't sell that long. I mean, longevity on novels that are that short, readers understand after a while that that yeah. it's kind of not gaming the system, but they're not getting a full book. And mm -hmm. it's also really hard, I think, as an author to have character development in 30,000 words. That's I mean, that's a novella. 30,000 is a short story, really. I mean, yeah. that's just over an, a novella length. Right. So that's really. why, I mean, I, I would probably write shorter books if I could. I just, that's just not part of my styling. I can't develop a story in that short amount of time. So yeah. mother authors can, and that's a trend. I mean, yeah. So, yeah. No, you did great. I was really impressed with Helldivers. Yeah. That book took me two years to write. That was like my night and weekend projects um, between oh. my extinction cycle. So, and that one, uh, my agent pitched wide. So that he pitched it to all the big publishers, Simon Schuster, Tor. I'm trying to think of like just pretty much everyone. And mm -hmm. in a situation like that, I mean, I've gone both routes where I just self-published. This one was the series that I thought would be good to go the traditional route because I felt it had a wider appeal for a science fiction audience. I think it'd make a great movie. I or hope something. so. Yeah, that would be really cool. So I'm, I'm just glad it's done as well as it has. I mean, the fact that, that it's done so well in audio has been amazing for me because that's been the, an audience. Who was What's the narrator? That? Who was the narrator? R.C. Bray. So okay. that's a huge piece of it. Yep. Yeah. I saw him in New York two weeks ago um, at Book Expo. Awesome. So yeah. that was great. He's, he's a really cool guy. An amazing so voice. Cool. Amazing creator. Yeah. Um, let's see. This is, let's see. Have you ever had any formal training or education in writing? Says Nick uh, Mikey Force. Yeah. I, I took uh, creative writing courses at the University of Iowa which has mm -hmm. a really, really good creative writing program, but that's the graduate program. I was taking the undergraduate classes. So a lot of my writing, I mean, I, I, I am, I understand, let's see, I'm just, how do I explain this? Like I didn't have that big of a formal background, but I'm kind of a self-taught. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I read a lot and I think, I think a lot of writers, writers are. are readers. Right. Mm -hmm. And we self teach ourselves. Yeah. 
quite a lot. We really do. Yeah. Um, oh, so Russ says, how many books do you juggle in the air at um, one time? I like to have two projects going on at all times because sometimes I might get stuck with a plot, even if I have it outlined for one series. So then I'll, mm -hmm. another thing I like to do is I normally don't write in the mornings. Um, just not productive in the morning. So I edit what I wrote the previous day yeah. to kind of get the mm -hmm. juices flowing. And then I right. write in the afternoon and I just switch things up. So, you know, a lot of people ask me how I can keep my character straight. Um, the only characters I have a hard time with sometimes are the dogs. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> like sometimes I want to call Creek Miles or Miles okay. Apollo. It's really you weird. You don't get but, dialogue, right? I mean, you don't get yeah, it. Yeah, no, no, I don't know why I do yeah. that. So, but the yeah. characters <laughs> you can keep straight unless it's a really old series. For example, book four, the Orb series that I co-wrote with Anthony Melchiori, a good friend of mine. Um, mm -hmm. That we didn't write that until three years after I wrote book one. So I really did have to go back and, you know, read over what I've yeah. written and a lot of I've had to do that. Me. Yeah, especially yeah. if you have to go back to a series. It is so, di I don't know how George R. R. Martin does it. I mean, he had to go back 10 what years later. Yeah. Yeah, he's that's just, just a, nuts. He can probably remember every word he's written. Well, no, but he's, yeah. he's a really smart guy. That he helps. is. He really is. Um, uh, Marcus Battle, I didn't know if I should say his name, but he is saying hi. He's a great mutual friend. Yeah. Um, what else do we have here? Oh, he says, what kind of coffee do you drink when you write at the coffee shop? And what section do you sit in at the library? <laughs> I don't go to the library anymore. Um, I don't either. I used I can't. to. People bug you. Yeah. Uh, but the coffee shop, I actually don't go to the coffee shop much either anymore. I'm, Me either. I, this is my, I'm in my office right now. I can give you guys a kind of a brief. Yeah, see. give the tour. And this is and the reason that I've, this thing's finished now. So I have my display wall of a couple, couple of my series. That is so cool. Yeah. I don't, I haven't done that. I should do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I love cool. looking at them. Here's trackers. So this is on a different. Oh, very um, nice. I have some antiques in here, like my civil war pistol. Wow. Um, then I have my reading chair and this is a, a painting that Blake Jameson did for me. Mm -hmm. He's a Helldivers fan and a really famous artist from California. And then this is the shelf of, of my books, my whiskey, cool. my typewriter. <laughs> and I don't have this whiskey. is the main, <laughs> that's the main shelf. So that's, those Very are my nice. other books. Yeah. And then I got a little bench and stuff and another desk back there too. Cool. So that's the office. And that's why I work here more because I have everything here that I need. Um, I think it's I once another, you feel, once you feel comfortable in your workspace, then, then you can, you can write there. Right. Yeah. But if you don't, I don't know, it doesn't work. I mean, I'll, on occasion I have to leave, you know, go find a coffee shop or whatever. But now yeah. typically I'm pretty much set where I am and I leave to go run or something. Do you do that? Do you? Yeah. Every day I try to exercise at least. My cheeks are still red from running earlier. Yeah. Probably, right. Is it hot there? It, um, off and on today. It's been kind of, it, it has been kind of warm. Yeah. It hasn't been too bad here today, but it's what kind of, Oh, a hundred. Oh no. And we've been like last week. It was in the hundreds. Yeah. Or then yeah. more than high nineties. Yeah. Oh no. Here the hot is like 75. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we do have some warm days, but later in the summer, what kind of coffee do you drink? Uh, coffee, espresso normally, um, cappuccino is my other go-to. I used to do mochas, but those are just really bad for you. They are. So, I just go yeah. black. Um, let's see. Go ahead and answer some questions. Okay. I'm trying to, to get caught up oh. here. Yeah, I know. Sorry. Um, trying to get this focused too. Okay. Um, <laughs> Hop is here. Are he says only four. Lame. Oh. I'm not sure what that yeah, Hoff is probably on his on book ten. Yeah, of the year because he has his own coffee business too. So he's just yes, old, like a little. And you bottom. still owe me coffee. Just saying, I think we had this conversation months ago, and I don't have the coffee. So, <laughs> um, let's see. And Walt asked. That's a good question by Walt yeah. Rounding about plot <laughs> and 
inspiration hits because the mafia book that I wrote this year was not planned last year. The space opera was planned. Um, so I, I decided to go after that um, idea and now I'm even wanting to write a second book in that series. It, I will Very write cool. a second book actually. And that's really just because of how, how much I um, enjoyed the storyline. So yeah, it's sometimes when inspiration hits, it hits. And um, that's another reason I'm also doing a tracker spinoff because, um, you know, sales wise, that might not be the smartest idea, but it's a story I enjoy. And I think it's also and that's what a you story have to that, do. You have yeah. to go with what you enjoy, what you have a vision for yeah. and see. Yeah, it's not right. about the and money. I, mean, I don't really, I don't, I'm lucky because I don't have to write to market like some people do. I, the market is already the stuff that I like to write is already popular. Mm -hmm. So I mean, my genre is already popular, so I don't have to like go into another genre and write something that I don't want to write in order to make money. I'm lucky. Yeah, I don't know if true. it will always be that way, but yeah. Um, let's see. Russ Olson, Colonel Olson asked, do you have a goal concerning the length of a book when you start? I always try to aim for between 80 and a hundred thousand words. And most of my books end up, being around a hundred thousand, uh, that's just typically how it how it happens. And that's a um, little long for most post apocalyptic yeah, for books, anyway. So, yeah, oh, yeah, it's yeah, almost double. It There's almost, a couple writers. Yeah. I think DJ Mole, Sam Sizabath. Um, mm -hmm. I'm looking at my shelf right now because um, most of those those are the authors that write really long books in this genre, and mm -hmm. I like that style um, because I can it gives say my first book was like that. <laughs> But just the first one, the rest were shorter. My it depends on the series. Like my tracker series is a little shorter than my extinction cycle, and same yeah. thing with Hell Divers is longer than all of them. I think um, Martha L. Leah Elmore Ellis still not enough books. Nick, I read too fast. Well, have you read all the the Kendra World books? Because those actually are going away on July. I was going to say okay, yeah. So. Um, but There's, yeah, get them while you can. Yeah, I should. I will be republishing some of those. Um, I, more on that later. I have to wait to, to hear back from my agent. Yeah. And that. But uh, I'm getting an echo. Are you getting an echo here? Sorry. I'm not, but I heard one earlier myself. Are you? Okay, I'm gonna take this. Can you still hear me if I take that yeah. out? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Hoff, we love Hoff. He's great. He will be on the show in a uh, couple of weeks. I awesome. think I'll have to look at the schedule. Yeah, he's one of my favorite. He I'm is. Wow. He, he has written a lot of post apoc but he's also kind of gone to Westerns and now Westerns, yep. or they used to say post-apocalyptic is the new Westerns. Uh -huh. And, uh, but man, he's just, he can, he can cross genres easily. He's, yeah. He does it really well. I remember when I first started writing, I was on in Kansas city on a trip and I saw his books in Barnes and Noble. And I was like, I want to be wow. that guy. Hey, that so is cool. Yeah, but um, and I have them on my shelf here. Uh, that was yeah. the end series. I need so. to send my dad his new westerns. I think he would really love that. Um, yeah. Rich Oliver says, "Are you a dog person yourself?" Yeah, absolutely. I love yeah. dogs. We have um, a pit bull and a Shih Tzu. Oh. Um, the Shih Tzu was mine. She's twelve. She's she's gotten kind of up there, and then the pit bull is my wife's. That's funny. Um, <laughs> almost 12 too i know but everyone thinks it's the opposite yeah. but, um i grew up with little dogs in my family and i had friends that had shih tzus and, and I, i'm probably not saying that right but i had, friends that had those in high school and i loved them and then when i got i wanted a husky in college but i didn't have the room for it so i got a shih tzu yeah. and she's been with me ever since Aww. um yeah but we want a german shepherd um, i love dogs um, and i'm a dog person but i now I can hear myself, but I recently rescued a cat. And then this week he's a tabby and he's awesome. And I had him shaved and we found out that he had a, an embedded collar at some point in his life. And he's such a sweet boy, but it just yeah. broke my heart. Yeah. That's very sad. Yeah. But he rescued, um, he's got a better life now. Oh, yeah. He's doing great. He's, he's the sweetest guy. Um, let's see. Office tour says, didn't we, Malloy, we did that. just rewind a little bit and yeah sorry Donna is my cousin hi cousin Donna um let's see uh uh Carl Wallace did we did you ask ask that one here's a bit of a nerdy question about the electrical storms that have plagued the planet in Helldivers are those storms based on science or are they all fiction 
So those are, it's kind of a little bit of both. I've tried to explain how that would work, but one thing I think that I didn't explain enough is what, um, what happened in hell divers. So before hell divers, what caused that world? And I talk about nuclear war, but the nu- the nukes that were used to destroy the world were much pow- more powerful than what we have now. So like, if you look back to what, um, the atom bomb in Hiroshima, that's like very small yield compared to what we have now, like China, China and Russia and the U S Russia actually has a nuclear weapon now that could take out the entire state of Texas. Um, and it's, they can mount it on a missile that's the size of a bus. This is just giving you a perspective of how big this thing is. And it can go, it's almost as fast as, um, speed of sound. I believe that might not be accurate, but it's really fast and we wouldn't be able to knock it down is the point. So this is held the world of hell divers is set 250 years in the future, but the apocalypse would have happened about 20 years from today, from the status quo. So that's um that's when the nukes would have uh, gone off and they are much higher yield than anything else and they're also I've, i talk a lot about how the airships survived because they're emp resistant um whereas a lot of the fighter jets at this time and i didn't go into details because they'd be future models and in, mm-hmm. in my extinction cycle books i use all current day models of everything pretty much um but in this book yeah, there's a little bit of suspension of dis- disbelief or a lot of i guess depending on the person um to understand how this would have happened but no the electrical storms were a result of the high yield nuclear weapons and they um and the emps that were set off too so um i wouldn't say that i went down the nitty-gritty science because it's theoretical it's Mm -hmm. not even you know it's not based on any fact so yeah it's closer to fiction i guess is the long answer but i wish i would have gone into a little bit more detail um, I thought I you did pretty good. That. I mean, I, um, I, I was reading about how, you know, the deep holes through Chicago and, and how that would have had the big craters, man-made craters. I mean, all of that is true. That would happen. I did have a question, though, when I was reading yeah. um, uh, research wise to me. Have you ever skydived yourself? Did no, you, uh, no. You, that's... Never have? you did great, though. I mean, Before... I thought for sure you must have had to do that in order to prepare yourself for that. That was actually a a topic of conversation before Helldivers was published because I was going to skydive for the launch. But Mm -hmm. one thing that I'm really terrified of is heights. So I decided to, yeah, the per, the genius behind the skydiving in Helldivers is my editor. His name's Michael Carr. Um, Okay. I've worked with him on all three Helldivers books, actually four Helldivers books now. And he's skydived probably 50, 50, 60 times. Um, So he really helped with that. You know, there's only so much you can do from research. Right. No, that's true. Thing, that's yeah. probably why, because yeah. I thought for sure you did. Yeah. No, uh, I mean, you can't, no one's probably jumped through an electrical storm blind and survived to tell about it anyway. So it's one of those other things yeah. that you just kind of have to suspension of, you know, leave. So I, I was just smiling because I saw Colonel Olson's comment about the wimpy dog, but if he experienced <laughs> Bella's wrath, he would not think she's such a wimpy dog. <laughs> She's actually more intimidating than our pit bull, believe it or not. So, so what is your typical day of writing an exercise? Um, you do your stuff in the morning. I do mine in the evening. It, you know, we all have a different system. It just seems to work. I, I pretty much work all the time, though. Um, I mean, I do my editing in the mornings, and I work out in the afternoon, and then I get back to writing until early evening. Oh, that's what um, I do. What I do. Yeah. And then yeah. some, some nights I work at night as well. If I'm mm-hmm. on a deadline, like lately I'm trying to finish this. Um, so I have really found that you've got it because you work from home, you have mm-hmm. to mark the end of the day somehow and leaving your place and going to the gym and coming to just seems to help with that. I yeah. Know, that was my experience. Yeah. That's my experience. It's definitely tough. I see a lot of authors struggling with self-motivation since it's yeah. such a, it's a career that you have to be driven. Right. Um, I think that, discipline. I, yeah. And that I really learned as, you know, growing up. And then also before I used to do Ironman triathlons. Yeah. So, where I live actually. So that's yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, I, I did, um, Coeur d'Alene. Lane. Well, I, that's Coeur where I am. I'm in Coeur d'Alene. Yeah. yeah. Right. So 
that training was just so intense. I did, I did two of them. So I, for basically two years straight, I was training all the time. I was working at, for Homeland Security and I was writing at night and on the weekend. So I really taught myself to be disciplined and kind of hit the ground running when I left my old job to write full time. So it's been, um, that's really helped me out a lot, but I'll tell you the biggest thing, and you probably will agree. The biggest thing that I think helps with the stress of this career is exercise. And without yeah. it, I would be stressed all the time. Sometimes, sometimes you just need to, you're working in your head. So sometimes you just need to run or, and that's what I do anyway, but you need to, you need to think about it, especially yeah. if you get stuck, you know, writer. Yeah. Running yeah. is a writer's sport. Um, and I noticed when I was riding orbs back when I was training for my Ironmans, um, I worked out a lot of plot issues on those long rides, on those long runs and, and swims. Mm -hmm. So it really does help. I've talked to Hoff about this too. I'm kind of stuck on my running game and he'll, he'll kind of, you know, give me pointers here and there. Um, and so, yeah, we trade secrets, you know, um, health and wellness yeah. and, you know, yeah. how to live this life. It's, it's, it's important it's to have writer friends when you're a writer yes. because everyone's struggling. Like even, you know, my wife, she she understands the stresses of this job, but it really takes another writer that's experienced certain things like, you know, if you've been trolled or yeah. Oh, yeah. experiencing yeah. reviews, negative reviews all the time, stuff like that. Uh, it's hard for people that haven't experienced that to, to really know how that affects creativity. It you does. Know, know, it yeah. gets in your head. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah. So, yeah. What else um, do we have here? Let's see. Uh, oh, I was going to say that um, I remember I, this was years ago, but uh, Stephen Conkley, he actually mm -hmm. mounted a, a thing on his, on his uh, treadmill, a desk on his treadmill. And I was... Hard. Oh yeah. So he was literally walking and writing at the same time. So that yeah. was kind of cool. I but then I was, I was talking to a friend about, uh, uh, recently about, about running this, the same thing anyway. Uh, who creates your swag asks Walt. Um, and how do you, yeah. This t-shirt was from Blackstone. I created the extinction cycle t-shirts myself. Well, I mean, I had an an artist designed the logo and whatnot, but I, I did that through Amazon merch is what it's oh. called. Um, my patches are through different companies. Blackstone does some patches. I do patches through custompatches.net for my tracker series, my, my extinction cycle series. I'm pointing to the Don't give away back. all your secrets. Don't give away all yeah. your, yeah. <laughs> well, they're not really, those aren't really secrets at all. I mean, those are, I think a lot of people do merch like this now. And, um, but Jack is a great fan of mine and yours too. And he says, so if you see me running, I'm, I'm chasing someone or I'm being chased. I have a feeling that's funny. correct. Yeah. Yeah. No, Jack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I gotta say you have had, I mean, whenever I was reading, I saw your absolutely fantastic character development. Uh, Thank you. The little guy with the hat. I mean, ten? Holy, yeah. yeah. Ten. Ten. And his name is 10. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, Michael Everhart is his that real was name. A really cool. Um, I was going to say that female, strong female characters, you have that down. So you've got uh, uh, Commander Ash. And mm -hmm. she is, I mean, the woman is actually dying of cancer, but she's like trying to take care of this whole thing. And I'm going to try not to give spoilers, but I do want to read a couple of passages. Hopefully that won't spoil things. Um, but she said, um, here she is, this woman is, she's got catastrophes all over the place and suddenly she's got to take care of um, an issue inside. Tell me if you don't want me to say anything, just, just no stay problem. stop. Um, and, and she says, so you think I'd sit here and watch our fire teams raid the farm, did you? I mean, she's dying of cancer. There's mayhem going on everywhere else and she is gearing up, arming up to actually run with these people to take care of stuff. I mean, I've been nailed for not having super tough female characters. That's tough. That's mom tough. Yeah, you, for you know, sure. You have a great mom. That's mom tough. Yeah, I sure do. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, you do. You have a great mom. She's been a friend of mine as well. Um, yeah. We just celebrated her birthday, early birthday last week. Last night, sorry, last night. Because I'll be out of town this weekend for her birthday. So, um, yeah. yeah, she's definitely been an inspiration for me. 
I don't know what it is, but uh, you, you get to know your writers and then you get to know your writer's mom or dad or cousins or what. It's just really cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I know Conkley's I, mom. She's awesome. Really? Oh, yeah. 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 And she will tell you when you're wrong, too. <laughs> Okay, so what is the most rewarding part of being a writer and author? Asked Daniel Green. Boy, that's a loaded question. You know, I actually tweeted about yeah. this today. Of cool. how, well, kind of. I just said how humbled I am to, to be able to do what I love. And that's essentially it. That I'm yeah. the most rewarding part of being an author for me is being able to share my stories with people and having, you know, for the longest time, I didn't think anyone would want to read my stories. And um, mm -hmm. I worked pretty damn hard at trying to get my books out there. And now that they are, it's just, it's incredibly humbling um, to mm -hmm. have people that, you know, on here right now asking me questions about my work. Um, it's, I never thought that was possible. I always dreamed of being a writer. Um, even in college, mm -hmm. but I never thought it would be possible. And and honestly, as many problems as, as I've had with Amazon, Amazon's provided in a, an excellent yes. platform when it works the way it's supposed to mm -hmm. for writers to share their stories with the world. And um, they've really brought writers and readers together. Right. All yeah. hell's on, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's how I feel too. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of your writing is very descriptive and it puts, it puts the reader right where they need to be. Here's, here's an example. He opened his eyes to find his family gone, replaced by the sky, the color of bruises. I mean, that's just a visual picture that immediately puts you in this dire, awful situation. And only good writing can do that well. And you do that. That was Thank impressive. Yeah. yeah. I remember that line, the color of bruises is one of my favorites. Yeah. My editor had something to do with that one. Gosh, Honestly. I was to say those things. <laughs> okay, here's another one, just in case, just because we don't have any great questions yet. He thought he was ready to die, but seeing all those open maws, he felt a familiar sensation, primal fear. Mm -hmm. I mean, even as a reader, that makes your skin shudder. I mean, it makes your, your spine shudder, I should have said. Um, that's Those are really great lines. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well deserved. Oh, and I got to say the one that made me cry and I won't, I won't give it away. Why? It's a very simple line, but it says, um, I'm, I'm getting choked up thinking about it. It's terrible. Um, I'm going to show you the sun. So if you haven't read hell divers, when you get to that line, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. And it's simple. I'm going to show you the sun. Yeah. That was really, really cool. Um, uh, thank you. And just another character development with Tin that said his hat wasn't just a hat. It had a force field that protected him from their comments. You know, I mean, without yeah. the hat, he's a 10 year old boy, a tragic, you yeah. know, 10, but the hat really, yeah, yeah that was really cool. Yeah. Anyway, so I just have to well, throw those things in really there. That's really awesome that you pulled those out. I've done a lot of interviews yeah. about books and, you know, sometimes the, the person hasn't read the book, um, You've not only read the book, but you've shared some comments. Oh, here's another one I, I have to say, sorry. Um, they were trading one hell for another, but they had no choice. There was only one way home, and that was up into the soup. Yeah. That, was, that was really, I'm sorry. That was really awesome. Yeah. Okay. That's I could keep crazy. going. I mean, I have several. Oh, yeah. yeah. I remember. That's like towards what the end. What were you the thinking? Book. Yeah. What were you thinking whenever you wrote that? Well, like normally... So it's hard, like when I'm writing Ten's character, like you said, he's a 10 year old boy. So right. it's hard for me to transport myself into a 10 year old body and mind, but I try mm -hmm. my best to do that. Um, going back to female characters, every single book I write has a female POV character. Yeah. Um, the Mafia book, I actually did not have one until about a month ago and I realized I, I have to have this because mm -hmm. I like to tell the perspective from both genders. And then also, mm -hmm. um, I just feel like it gives the reader a better perspective on the world that I'm creating. So, yeah. um, but I think the reason that I've gotten better at female character development is because of the fact I've used strong female leads in every book. I'm looking at my shelf right now. Orbs has Sophie, um, Extinction Cycle has Kate, uh, Trackers has Secretary of Defense Montgomery. And also Sandra Spears, 
Um, Hell Divers has Captain Ash, and then Magnolia. Mm -hmm. um, Magnolia, yeah. My new series has Camilla Santiago, um, and Lucia Moretti, but she's not really a good good guy. Good, good, girl. <laughs> good girl. So I like okay. to have good. She's probably a very good bad girl. Yeah, she's a she's a villain. Is oh, what, okay, very uh, cool. So she's not an actual POV, but she's a main character. Camilla is okay. a main. She's a POV. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but I, I like to diversify. Also, you know, have I don't go into politics any of my books. I don't really. I do I use religion as world building, but like I don't think I've ever used the word Democrat or Republican in any of my books. And yeah. I've talked a little bit about maybe in one I might have, but out of the other twenty one books I've written, I haven't done that um, because. I I like to I think that reading should be an escape and entertainment. Mm -hmm. Although I do write post apocalyptic fiction as a warning too, if this is kind of what could happen if we're not careful with our environments, um, their governments. But yeah. I do like to diversify my characters, and sometimes that does offend people. You know, I even had people offended that I portrayed Nazis in a negative light in my tracker series. So no matter what you do, yeah. you know, you know yeah. there's going to be people out there that are going to take things. Mm -hmm. the, the one thing you have to keep in mind, though, and I will say this to you as to people maybe listening to this as a reader. It's like my favorite book right now is The Force by Don Winslow. He mm -hmm. wrote The Cartel, too. And like you have to understand that he's writing – that's not his beliefs that he's writing about. Those POVs he has, he's building characters. So, like, if right. there's someone that's racist, for example, that doesn't make the author racist. Exactly. Or, yeah. yeah. So, this is fiction I mean, sometimes, and just sometimes, they, yeah, sometimes you yeah. might have that, but very rarely do you. When you create characters, a good author creates a character that is not their opinion. It's a, just an a everyday person. So. That's kind of what I'm trying to explain here. I'm hoping I'm doing it in, the, in a good way. No, like, you're, yeah, um, you're right. Um, um, Carl Wallace Carl says, Wallace. I can hear my voice, I sorry. I listen to my books on Audible, but I never really follow an author other than other Neil Gaiman until now. Oh, cool. Oh, and Thank he's you, awesome. Carl. Yeah, yeah Neil Gaiman you. is. Really, you know what? There, I would explain this, but I keep hearing myself. Um, there, w there was a story that I heard about Neil Gaiman, and I have to share it really quick. So there were two Neils, and they were at the White House for some party or something. And one Neil says to the other, I don't know why I'm here. I shouldn't be here. This is the thing that authors, we do this to ourselves. So he says, I don't know why I'm not that great. I shouldn't be here, right? This is Neil Gaiman. And the other Neil said, I used to feel that way, but you have every right to be here. You've done something great, whatever. The other Neil's name was Neil Armstrong. Wow. Yeah. So I try to remember that, you know, you yeah. try to don't beat yourself up so much whenever you have great, um, whenever you have occasionally a bad review, you can't. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. What else do you have? How did you get such good narrators? Um, the, the publisher usually picks the narrator for Helldivers. I was given options on that, which they were all fantastic. I liked each and every oh, one wow. of them. Um, but I wanted to, to uh, I really loved the way R.C. Bray read the sample. So we went with him. Um, I think I'll have more say, hopefully, in um, my future books with Blackstone, or at least give it been, I think they'll give me options, which they have in other cases, too. I was not given any options when I was with Audible for my for a couple of my books. So, And I think that's just kind of common. I don't think it's normal that a publisher gives the author a option on who can read the book or who will read the book. Sorry. So right. I got lucky. Like Bronson Pinchot is amazing. He did my extinction cycle. He redid my orb series. He did my tracker series. And then RC Bray has done my hell series and he's just been, just been fantastic as well. So. Um, um, go ahead and Jason Holder. I mean, do you see that one? Do you want to? See? Yeah. Um, wait till, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of my characters I do kill off because that's the other thing. In post-apocalyptic fiction, I think the most realistic post-apocalyptic fiction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. and, but the other thing is, like, the way they die has to be realistic. So you, mm -hmm. I don't kill people to kill people for shock right. effects. Like, mm -hmm. there's been a couple characters that I didn't want to – 
I wanted them to continue in my series, but it just made sense. It just seemed like that would be organic. Um, right. One of them was Alex Riley. He was my favorite character in the Extinction Cycle, and he was gone in book two. Um, or was it book three? I can't remember now. Sorry. Uh, it's been so long since I wrote that one. But he I has one like that that I still get emails about, and they're like, yeah. why did she have to die? Yeah. In real life, she would have died. Yeah. You know, I can't keep a character around just because – it's not realistic and it's tough. Do you ever get upset like back when you're actually writing these things whenever you know, um, does it doesn't bother you? It bothers me. Yeah, I think I have a harder time have, when I write scenes where animals are hurt. Yeah. I never yeah. killed a dog in the book and I won't, but I don't know why, but I'm just, I'm such a softy for animals. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's definitely been times where I've been upset. Like Alex's character, I. O'Reilly's character. I did not want to do that. Um, there's some stuff that happened to Reed Beckham in the extinction cycle that, you know, I felt like I was beating him up too much, but he just kept going and um, he wanted to just keep, keep going in each book, I guess. I don't know. Um, yeah. Xavier Rodriguez and Helldivers is the same way. He just keeps going. Um, so I do see a question here from Josh Levine about mm -hmm. uh, character development and how, developing okay i'll just read it uh okay. you're really good at developing depicting various attributes of humanity in your characters the evil neutral and good sides of people how do you decide what alignment a character is going to oops, oops. that just popped away i sorry. did it I, I did that sorry okay oh, okay <laughs> um now I, I lost the the comment here but well, how do you decide what alignment a character is going to have go ahead um, okay, how do you decide what alignment a character is going to have and how you will, you will portray, portray those attributes in your writing? Do you end up whiteboarding or mind mapping them out? I, I used to do a lot of that with characters where I'd actually do a profile on them. Um, but now I don't, I don't really do that anymore. I just, it's just all in my mind. And I know I have like a plan set for a lot of these people and where they're going to go. Um, but like in terms of actual character development, especially for like the villains, uh, the, I think villains are easier to write than good people. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because all you have to do is just think of the worst possible thing you could do to someone and then turn them into a character like that. And, and oftentimes I tone things down a lot that I would normally, that especially in this mob book, there's a mob book. There's a lot of things that I could have probably done like that. But going back to Don Winslow, his cartel book is brutal. There's some terrible wow. things in there, but they're real. That's honestly happening, like mm -hmm. at our border and and in places oh, yeah. in Mexico. It's, it's some it's of, yeah, yeah. Some of the MS13 gangs and stuff are very, very brutal. I mean, mm -hmm. so I I think that you have to strike a fine balance. Some readers aren't able to handle that stuff, um, so I try to create villains and characters that do bad things, but that I don't describe things to get under your skin most of the time. Like I just describe things on how they would be done. Like in the tracker series, for example, before I ever read the cartel, I was writing about MS 13 because I did a police ride along in New York last year for book expo. And we went to, I, think I saw that. I think I saw yeah. that Facebook with you and Maria. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She was on it too. I don't know why I brought her, but uh, she enjoyed it actually. But we went, we were truly in the projects of Jamaica and um, in New York, not the the island. So, mm -hmm. and they have problems with the MS-13 there and some things that have gone down are just insane. Oh. Like, like I don't even want to describe it. No, so, no. yeah. Um, Imagination's hard enough. Let's see. So Sherry Elliott is asking about how I deal with bad reviews. I mean, the only reviews that I really read are on Amazon. I avoid pretty much every other site. I av Same. avoid Goodreads yes. for obvious reasons. Um, maybe I should explain what the obvious reasons are, but um, I guess No, not. we don't want to invite okay. issues. Okay. Let's just not do that. Uh, well, there's just so many of them there anyways. It would take me forever. I think there's like 25,000 plus on there um mm -hmm. for my books now um uh, but on amazon i try i do try to read negative reviews for feedback for critical feedback that yeah. that has helped me in my books mm -hmm. but for the most part i have to remind myself that like most of my reviews are positive the only reviews that upset me probably are ones from other authors that are doing it out of spite or com competition which does happen um 
Rarely. I think every I author experiences yeah. that. Yeah. At least one. So that's, yeah. yeah, I think that can be upsetting, but for the most part, I understand readers a lot. Some readers aren't going to like my books and everyone has a right to their opinion, to their Your honest opinion. really red. So. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm just like, God, that's terrible. Um, let's see what else. Some are funny. Oh, re oh, some of the bad reviews. Oh my gosh. Yeah, we should have a, and, and occasionally authors will get together and we'll say, look at this. Yeah. <laughs> and then they'll yeah. show you their worst review. It's really I know. Yeah, it's kind of, there's like a support system. Some, yeah. some of my author friends don't read their reviews at all. Um, I talked to an author at BEA, very famous author. I'm not going to say who it is because I don't know if they'd want me to, but his wife reads his reviews and then tells him which ones to read, I think is kind of how they described it. So mm -hmm. it's a personal thing. I, it is. I think a lot of authors struggle with this. Yeah. I've, I have at times too, but you know, the one, I don't know if there's too much more to say about reviews. Honestly, I, yeah. I just try to take them no. and, you know, try to understand. You try to that. glean something. You try to glean something from them. If, if there's something to glean from it. If not, it's best yeah. to just move on, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, looks like oh. Carl's got a question that I think he's asked twice now. So what is your favorite thing you've learned yeah. doing research for a project? I have a funny story here. So um, I was researching the best way to land. Uh, sorry, I keep using my hands there. It's probably not. I do um, that too. When, All right when you're skydiving, if your chute doesn't open, what is the best way to land? I was the, was what I was researching. That's good to know. And, yeah. So one, and I actually ended up talking to my agent about this because I don't remember how it even came up, but this was like three years ago. So, so uh, are, are you supposed to land on your side if you have to crash? Land? Is that I think you're supposed, yeah, you're supposed to like bring your knees up, land on your feet, I think. But I read what? one comment. Yeah, that you're supposed to huh. land on your head because that's the hardest part of your body. And I brought that up to my agent. I'm like, and he just started laughing. He's like, "No way, Nick! You can't. You're not supposed to land on your head." Like, I, that was that was the funniest yeah. thing that I ever came across in research. It's not accurate, obviously, yeah. but you're supposed to try to to find a place like give a tree or I mean, water actually is not the best place to land either because hmm. when you're hit, when you're going a certain speed, it's like hitting concrete. So wow. I don't know. Um, if, you're, if your chute doesn't open, you're pretty much doomed. Yeah, you're if you're in a chute, if you're falling off a two-story building, from what I've read, the best way to land is like on your side, on just your to side. spread the impact. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But if you're coming out of the air in a parachute, yeah, I don't. I think you're supposed to tuck and yeah. roll actually if you're like coming down really Let's fast. Try. But yeah, yeah, probably not going to save you. Um, but Let's the not actual, try that. yeah, no. <laughs> Um, so that's probably my favorite funny story about research. I'm not I'm trying funny. to think of like, like the actual. Um, Do you ever feel like when you're typing stuff in for research that you're like, yeah, I could so get arrested for this or, you know, I, just I see authors writing that sort of thing all the time on Twitter. Like, Oh my God, I'm going to get in trouble for writing this. But yeah. no, I, I learned a long time ago that like how that stuff works and that the government is, if they're tracking you, they're tracking you for a reason. It's probably not because you're one, you're writing questions like this in your browser. But yeah, I know a lot of people like, have joke you know, about that. How far does a knife have to insert before it hits your heart? Or yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, just we come up with the craziest things, so mm -hmm. you have to actually research them. Right. Yep. All right. Wow. So okay. So where can everyone find your stuff? Um. So I'm, I'm, I would just say Amazon's the best way to find like my eBooks and, and my audio books. Um, Downpour is Blackstone's site that you can listen to audio on. That's a cool one. Audible, you know, of course as well. Um, my website, the store's not open right now, but I do do signed paperbacks. I do sell those for my office if anyone's ever interested in something like that. But um, for the most part, you know, all my stuff's on Amazon. Some of my stuff's in Barnes and Noble right now. My Extinction Cycle, I believe, is all still there in mass market paperback. Helldivers might be stocked um, in some stores. I'm not sure how wide. Um, I think Helldivers 2 should be hitting airports, the Hudson News, at some oh, point wow. as well. Helldivers cool. 1 was there, yeah. Blackstone's been able to get those into the Hudson stations. So, yeah, mostly are on you, Amazon. Are you going to be at Thriller Fest? 
I'm just thinking no, I'm what's the next really... airport I'll be in. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm not going to do any more conventions okay. this year, I don't think. Uh, we're planning on heading to Germany for um, a convention there. Um, oh. Other than that, um, yeah, the Extinction Cycle publisher is from Germany. Or, well, they're it's not Lucifer. Cycle. Yeah, it is. Oh, yeah. well, say hi for me. My stuff's there, too. Okay. Cool. I yeah, want to go. Festa Verlag is the publisher of the Extinction. Actually, they're doing all my books now in German. They're oh, doing okay. Trackers, Helldivers. Oh, okay. They're not doing Orbs, but I think Orbs is with Penguin. I can't even remember. It's been so long. I mean, they mm -hmm. acquired those rights years ago, and it's still not, book one still isn't out yet. But it takes a while to translate. Yeah. The one it cool thing I will say. A year and a half for, the first, for my first one, anyway. Yeah. yeah, it takes a while. But Festa Verlag is putting Extinction Horizon, book one of the Extinction Cycle, and, and they're translating it into German, doing an audio version, which will be my first audio version. So pretty cool. That is very cool. Um, so just a couple more quick questions. Where did the idea, are you guys hearing a double voice? Sorry. Um, okay, good. Where did the idea for the absolutely awesome patches come from? Um, actually, those came from other authors. I know quite a few authors in the post-apocalyptic genre that were doing patches for their readers. Oh. Um, some were doing wristbands too, but I love patches myself. So I decided to just go ahead and do those. Um, and like I said, I have different companies that make those and then I have different artists that kind of come up with the designs but yeah mm -hmm. so I think it's a really cool way to kind of showcase um, your book and um, readers really seem to like them a lot so that is cool uh, my buddy Jason Benneke J. Luke Benneke greetings from California you guys are doing great I interviewed him last from the um, the Davenport from the uh, the convention oh cool uh, yeah and we had a great time there and uh he, he did a book on uh, self-driving cars, a thriller craziness. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Very cool, yeah. Uh, if you do another event, do it in Chicago. So I was there Green. at Book Expo two years ago, Josh. But I think yeah, Josh is newly, or wait, no? I can't remember if he just moved to Chicago, but I feel like he did. Very, yeah. cool. Very cool. Okay, anything okay. else you want to add? or? Uh, just thank you for having me. This has been fun. You're I really welcome. appreciate you reading Helldivers too and kind of bringing up those those different passages. Yeah. Oh my gosh, awesome. it was an amazing book. I was really impressed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, you definitely are a wonderful writer and totally recommend your, your work. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Well, sometimes you know an author forever and I mean years, and but you never get around to reading their books. So I'm so glad I finally did. And uh, yeah. yeah, I was really impressed. So yeah, yours too. Yeah. Um, which book of yours should I read next? Um, Grand's Resolution, um, okay. the China pandemic. Yeah. So that's kind of my, that my looks, thing. Is it, where's that one set again? That's actually set in the Northwest in the North. here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Coeur d'Alene, is it? Is that, uh, it's actually, did that you one's just actually, move to Coeur d'Alene? Coeur d'Alene, I moved, I moved here about two years ago now. Okay, so, I so, thought you were yeah. always there doing research for your books but I, I was but it's I, I lived in near Spokane Washington and it's just not even an hour away so okay. I, I moved over there. Coeur d'Alene Lane's an amazing little town I love that place. Yeah it, it really is it's such a cool little town in the winter it's like this frozen thing I've got to get out of here in the winter yeah but, um, but summers are awesome yeah anyway thank you so much. Yeah thank and, you um, thanks to everybody that joined us. Yes thank you thank good night you. everyone. Good night thank you.